this is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, Rebels, and welcome to a bonus episode. This is eight lessons I learned from narrating and producing my first audiobook. Now, I just want to caveat this before we go into it. I am clearly not an expert at uh, narrating and producing audiobooks. I have but one. However, I did learn a metric fuckload from this process. And I personally really value when people uh, post lessons learned or share things and mistakes that they've made. Um, And so I thought that I would share my lessons in the hope that if any of you guys uh, want to narrate and produce your own audiobooks, you might be able to avoid some of the many mistakes I made on my journey. Okay, uh, we are going to dive straight into the lessons because this is um, a bonus episode and therefore we don't need all of that intro that I usually do. Okay, so number one, you're always going to be a noob. So here's the thing, I do have voice acting experience. When I was a teenager, I had an agent. I also starred in a TV show as the lead uh, actress in um, a CBBC's CBBC, Children's BBC uh, program. I did voiceover work. I had a showreel. I did a CD-ROM for S Club 7. I did radio stuff for like adverts for Haven Holidays. So yeah, like I have experience. I also spent a long time in the theatre. So I very naively Um, Oh wait, I also podcast. (laughs) So I've been podcasting for two years. So naively, or or like maybe arrogantly, I figured I would wipe the floor (laughs) with this audiobook exercise. Oh, Sasha, you sweet, sweet naive fool. Oh, I don't think it matters how long you're in this game, this creative game. If you keep doing new things, if you keep trying to grow and develop, and I highly recommend that you do, if you keep experimenting, then you are going to stumble across things you have not done before, which means you are going to make mistakes. And believe me, I think I must have made every single fucking mistake possible on this journey. But, you know, what it meant was that I was taken right back to the beginning again. And in a weird way, I'd almost forgotten what it was like to be a newbie in this world, which is terrifying because... I don't feel like I've been in this world that long, really. Um, I've only been full time for two years. Granted, I've spent several years working on my craft and, and the business side before that. But really, you know, I haven't been around that long. And I suppose that also makes me realize just how fast things change in this industry, but also how fast I change. And I always think that I don't change. And, you know, it's, I struggled sometimes to see how I've grown and so that's why exercises like this are really important to me to do lessons learned but also to reflect back and realise that I can still be a newbie because I keep doing things that are outside of my comfort zone and things that I haven't done before and so of course I'm going to make mistakes (laughs) despite what I like to tell myself I'm not a fucking superhero so there's that. Um... But the other thing is that I'd forgotten how frustrating it is to be new at something. I'd forgotten how frustrating it was trying to work out how to upload and publish a book for the first time. I stumbled multiple times in this process, like, and at every stage, not not least, you know, the recording and editing, but also in the publishing and uploading. Um, and, you know, I would 
do something thinking I'd gotten it to the finishing line only just only like to discover that I had 85,000 other things that I still needed to do just to complete the one task that I'd originally started you know like for example when I was uploading the files the audiobook files um I had remembered that I needed an opening credits and an ending credits although I did forget to say the end and had to go back in the recording booth to to re-record it after I'd already announced that I'd finished um but one of the things that I forgot in the uploading process was that you need a sample and I don't know it just bypassed my brain I just assumed that that was something that Audible took from the audio that you uploaded but no you actually need a separate file that's five minutes long to upload and so you know every single step I went along I would get so pissed off because there would be something else new that I didn't know or something that I had taken for granted or forgotten. This whole process has been a strange humbling interesting frustrating and awesome process. I definitely will admit that I loved and hated parts of it but what it did do was give me a much deeper sense of achievement. Um, I definitely had started to take for granted publishing books um, because things go on autopilot once you've done it two or three times, you know, and I've, I don't even know how many books I've published, but it's in the teens now. Um, Once you've done it that many times, you definitely do things on autopilot. And I don't really like living on autopilot. I like to be present. I like to be tested. I like things to be tricky and interesting. And I like to be learning and growing. And so this really gave me a sense of achievement that I haven't felt in a long time. And that's interesting to me. That tells me something I need to... I need to continue pushing myself outside my comfort zone because I like the sense of achievement I get when I've done something new that was hard um, and interesting. And I think it also has prompted me to remember that publishing a book is really fucking hard and um, I should appreciate publishing the books that I have a bit more. Now, I... uh, I need to caveat that because I don't mean that I don't appreciate it. I do. I just mean that I don't think I credit myself enough. That's quite hard for me to say because I feel like it sounds arrogant, but that's not not what I mean. I just mean it's a monumental effort to produce a book and I have just been taking for granted that that's a thing that I do. Yeah, anyway, I'm going to move on. Um... But I think the takeaway for me on this one is to remember never to get comfortable again. And I I feel like I've said that in one of my other roundups before. But anyway, number two, booth building, wobbly wheels and dogs. We built a booth to record in uh, for me. So, you know, if you're not able to do that, you might not find this section as useful. Uh, But my incredibly talented wife built me a booth. She built it on a base that was three foot by three foot. So a three foot square um, that, and it was kind of like a phone booth, like a British phone booth. I don't know if you know what those look like, but um, it lives in the garage. Um, because the garage has, uh, it is exter- is an exterior building and uh, it also has electricity. The original plan was to have it in, in the house and in, my, in the corner of my office. But after having built it, I am so ridiculously relieved that we situated it outside. Not least because it would have been a giant fucking eyesore in my office. But also because after all the homeworking over COVID... I'd never have gotten the silence and muted sound that I needed in the house. My wife was on or is still on conference calls and phone calls all fucking day. And my mic is super powerful and would have picked that up even in a sound, almost soundproofed um, audio booth. So that is something to consider if you have uh, members of your family who work at home. I, you are either going to have to negotiate the time of day that you record or you are going to have to um, put it outside. So the booth itself is made out of MDF. 
um, or just, you know, like cheap wood, essentially. We drilled it together with screws and situated it on an MDF base. We cut a hole out of one of the panels to make a door and hung it back on with just bog standard hinges. The door hanging was a bit of a saga, I will be honest. We didn't quite get it right. Um, we had to use new tools, tools that were new to us to do it. Um, it <laughs> the door is a bit of a bitch to shut uh, as a result because we didn't quite get it right, but it does function. Um, and I did sort of put a kind of a handle on it. The booth is obviously completely enclosed so it has a base and a roof um, and yeah so what else? Okay my sister-in-law had a really good idea of using spare carpet that we had so we had when we moved we brought this house a year ago and when we moved in we had all of the carpets ripped out because they were minging um, and we because of COVID, we'd had to measure ourselves, so we slightly overordered what we thought we needed. And um, when they offered to take the spare carpet away, we were like, mm, no, we paid for it, we'll keep it. Unsure what we were gonna use it for. However, shortly after, my sister-in-law had this brilliant idea of lining the audio booth with carpet. So um, you literally step into my audio booth and every single wall, the floor and the ceiling and the back of the door are all lined with uh, carpet. And it, it was g genuinely the best thing that we could have done. I would highly recommend everybody else to do this. It was a great initial layer. It kept the booth just a fraction warmer than it would have been, you know, just with like pure wood. Um, and uh, it made it nicer to stand on too. And even with just the carpet, the sound was already starting to muffle. I then brought three acoustic panels, one for each side um, of the, the booth, except the door. So obviously I could have done the back of the door, but my body was facing the, like my back was to the back of the door. I would sort of get in and face the, the opposite wall. And so I felt it wasn't necessarily necessary to, to put a panel on the back door. Um, so yes, I ordered acoustic paneling, uh, three of them. And because I am a whore for branding, I paid extra to have them in purple. <laughs> anybody else can see it but you know I like the fact that they're in purple. I then used acoustic foam which is sort of those triangular pointy uh, black foam thing squares that have the triangle points on them to fill in the gaps and the carpet segments so we sort of cut carpet for, to fit each wall um, and then nailed it in. Um, but that left just tiny little gaps. So I filled in those gaps with acoustic foam. Um, and then we hung the um, acoustic panels in the center of the uh, each wall. Um, and then, yeah, so we kitted out the inside of the booth with a mic stand and a sound shield. And that's really about it. Um, oh yeah, so I also put like these circular sort of push to, to turn on LED lights. Uh, they were just battery operated and I just popped them above the uh, panels, like acoustic panels and just sort of rested them on there. Uh, but I did actually find that those three LED lights weren't really bright enough. Most of the time I was reading off my phone, um, but certainly when I was doing edits, I used a paperback copy. And so I ended up with a light clipped to my mic stand, like a normal bedside light. So that might be something to consider. Um, yeah, I kind of wish I'd started with a bit with a brighter light. Last then, in terms of the build, we also drilled a small hole in the side of the booth after it was built uh, and after we decided where it was going to sit in the garage. And that was so that we could pull the USB wire that connects the mic to the laptop through a very tiny ho hole so that it didn't let too much um, noise in. I think the biggest lesson I learned was that we decided to attach locking wheels to the base of the booth so that we could move it uh, in and around the garage if we needed to or like easily because one person can move it if you take the locks off or that we could take it with us when we moved house. This was a really good idea in theory because obviously we put the time and effort into building it, it's really fucking useful and I would like to take it with us. However, it lifted the booth off the floor, meaning that the base platform didn't have like any, uh, what's the word, uh, like foundations. It was just like hovering. And so 
<laughs> what it meant is if any chunky butts stepped onto the platform, and being the chunky butt that I am, it would wreak havoc with the audio. Even if I was stood still, if I moved at all whilst recording, there would be a creak. So... I essentially had to stay completely motionless while narrating, which was difficult when I personally am quite aggressive with my gesturing. So partway through, I had to fix this problem and I fixed it by placing wooden planks under the booth that kind of like touched the floor and touched the uh, base of the of the booth. So it they worked as foundations, I suppose. Um, and that strengthened the base. And I then tried to stand on the bit, like the bit where the wood is, so that, um, you know, the bits where there, <laughs> what am I trying to say? The bits where there weren't planks supporting it underneath uh, still creaked a tiny bit. So yeah, that was probably the biggest lesson that I learned uh, with creating it. Number three, kit and caboodle. So what else do you need? Well, I use a sound shield, uh, which is like a semicircle filled with acoustic foam. You don't need one of those, especially if you have all the other acoustic paneling and stuff in your booth. But I, you know, <laughs> went all out and wanted to make this uh, as good quality as I possibly could. So I shelled out. I think the, the sound shield was about 70 quid. Um, I then have a pop filter or a windshield over my mic. I have a mic stand because I stand in the booth. I use a Blue Yeti mic and uh, I have a USB wire connecting it. I use Amadeus Pro, which is the software. Audacity is free and suitable for a Mac or PC and is very, very similar to Amadeus Pro. It is perfectly fine. I started editing my podcast on Audacity uh, and then I invested in Amadeus Pro just because I liked the look of it slightly better. And I think Amadeus Pro was about 50 quid. Um, and then, um, sorry, I don't think I have necessarily told you the prices of everything. I think the mic stand was not very much, maybe 30 quid. A pop filter windshield is less than a tenner. Uh, my Blue Yeti mic is about 130 quid, I wanna say, 100 quid, 130 quid. Uh, what else? I used Carl Hughes's audio mastering services and I will put the link to that in the show notes. Um, I use WeTransfer, which is a free bit of online software to transfer large files. And I had to do it in two or three chunks because I had like five gigs of audio. <laughs> um, obviously my laptop, an infinite supply of honey, lemon and ginger tea. And last, but by no means least, your inner diva. Uh, so yes, I will put links to all of these things in the show notes. Please note they are most likely going to be affiliate links. And um, I will, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, links in the show notes, essentially, for all of those things. I just thought I'd whistle through them. Number four, mouth sounds suck. It is, quite frankly, fucking astonishing to me how many bastard sounds our mouths make. There are clicks and tuts and clucks and claps and sticky wet noises and pops and that's the fucking shit you don't even mean to do. <laughs> like, here is what I know and what I have learned. Stay the motherfuck away from dairy. It makes your mouth really claggy um, and the sticky sounds rife. I did not manage to get rid of everything uh, from the audiobook. I got rid of the vast majority of them, but there are still some things that, you know, I would have preferred to have removed. Perhaps it's just me being a perfectionist, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm probably going to have to Google some solutions to that, I think, um, before I do the next one. Right, the next tip then is to eat before you work. I didn't eat on many occasions thinking that uh, if I put food in my belly, my belly would gurgle. Um, but uh, ironically, it gurgled because it was hungry. And uh, my, all mics, if you have a good enough mic, will be powerful enough to pick up the belly gurgling. So you do need to eat. The other reason you need to eat is that I actually noticed that I tired quicker uh, narrating on days when I didn't eat. Um, so yeah, that was a bit of a lesson to me that uh, actually eating is more sensible and you can go on for longer. 
So having gotten rid of the myriad of sounds that nearly drove me to insanity, I will like never understand why people like ASMR. Like, I don't know what it is about that, but fuck me. I literally never want to hear any ASMR sounds because I had to get rid of so many for the fucking audiobook. Um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, vocal health, I tried to plan like podcasting away from the days that I was narrating because I did find that although I didn't go hoarse or anything, I kind of had this residual ache in my throat. Like using muscles when you go to the gym, right? You know, you go and you overuse your muscles to put them into failure and then you build and repair your muscles. But I didn't want to put my voice into failure. So I drank a lot of ginger, honey and lemon tea. That was very soothing to my throat. Um, And yeah, you know, yeah, drink ginger, honey and lemon tea. I found it incredibly useful. The other thing, uh, if possible, work in one to two hour sprints, maybe smaller than that when you first start, because one, it is exhausting, and two, uh, your voice will get sore very quickly. The other thing I did was put a seat outside the booth, um, or like, if you're doing it indoors, then maybe have cushions or a sofa nearby, because... Um, I was a bit brutal on myself and like tried to get through whole chapters before I would come out for a break and I just think it was stupid and it's not an endurance game this is getting it right game so yeah like take take more breaks than me (laughs) Um, and give yourself that time to sit down. Uh, The other thing is that, um, oh yeah, I made the mistake of sitting down for a couple of chapters. And what I noticed when I edited is that sitting down changed the location of my mouth in proportion to where the mic was. And it also crushed my vocal or I guess my lungs or my chest, I don't know, but it led to more mouth sounds and an abundance of editing hours slapped on the end of my editing total. I'm guessing that sitting changes the shape of your airways. In summary, stand bitches or behold the copious amount of hours you'll need in post-production. Number four, it's a performance, darling, so perform. Recording audiobooks is definitely a performance. You get to be a diva, an actress, a fucking darling for the day. So have fun. It is so much fun talking your words and putting all of the sarcasm and expression and nuanced voice uh, that you put into your text words and text voice as you do then into the voice that you narrate with. If you're narrating like your own words, then you get to say them exactly as you intended them to be said, which is so much fun, especially if you have, you know, quite a unique voice. The other thing I would say is it's also tiring. Like it is knackering. I found that after an hour or two in the booth, I was done in. My throat ached, even though, like I said earlier, I wasn't hoarse, but I was like tired enough that if the literary gods had allowed, I'd have taken a nap. But, um, you know, alas, the bastards smited me with more work, but such is life. I definitely feel like I learned a tough lesson with this one. I almost got the performance right, but I wasn't quite as relaxed as I wanted to be. And I think that the next audiobook, I will probably sink into that and therefore it will be even better because I've gone through this one and I've practiced. Don't get me wrong, I still performed and I am still really, really fucking proud of what I've created. I just know that I can do better. So, um, I wanted to give you some examples of what performing means to me. So I am going to read a quote that is from the audiobook, 13 Steps to Evil, How to Craft a Super Bad Villain. And I'm going to read it twice, once where it's a straight read and once where I perform it. So this is the straight read. What it means is that when you create your villain, whatever traits you do show need to be in your face. Like a red light district's glowing streets, only louder and with big red fire truck sirens that blast come and get me sugar in your reader's face. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. It's a straight read, uh, but I like to perform. So this is closer to how I actually read it. 
What it means is that when you create your villain, whatever traits you do show need to be in your face. Like a red light district's glowing streets, only louder and with big red fire truck sirens that blast, come and get me sugar, in your reader's face. I hope that provides you an example. Um, I hope you can hear the difference. One, the second one is obviously much more animated. There is much more up and down tone, roller coaster tone in my voice. Um, and I, I hope that the second one is much more engaging. So yeah, I just wanted to provide an example of what performing meant to me um, and how I try and capture that sarcasm, the cheeky rebellious, I guess, tone in my voice. Number five, recording is Fifty Shades of Savage, but I kind of liked it. Okay, down to business. How do you record? You and your fashion diva. Okay, so wear cotton fabric, jogging bottoms, loose jumpers. Don't wear anything nylon or crunchy or crispy. Um, don't wear jeans or anything like that because that shit rustles when you move and your mic will pick it up. Remove bracelets and any loose jewellery and even watches that tick. And whatever you do, if I haven't impressed this enough on you, don't drink milky coffee. Don't eat cereal with milk or porridge with milk or chocolate unless you're recording a um, ASMR, in which case off you fucking pop sunshine and have fun. Refreshments, okay, ones that are good, black coffee, water, ginger, honey and lemon tea. I think I've mentioned all of those. Um, I did drink a lot. I found um, that I needed to, uh, yeah, keep lubricating. <laughs> I'm gonna move on. Uh, okay, so what did I end up eating? Well, I found like oat-based flapjacks kind of good. They're not obviously the healthiest of things, but um, I often make my own flapjacks, so that is slightly better. If I needed a sip of water uh, whilst recording, I tended to take cold water into the booth. Um, I would just leave the recording going when I took a sip because, uh, you know, when you edit, you need to listen to the whole thing anyway. And it was very obvious from the waveforms, like where the sound would drop out. Um, what else? I left generally hot drinks out of the booth. I think I took one in once, um, but it gave me the opportunity to step out of the booth and rest for a few minutes whilst I took some sips. So yeah, that's how refreshment works for me. Anyway, breathing. Okay, podcasts have a ton of breathing in them and stray breaths. I don't delete out any breaths pretty much when I am podcasting, except maybe the one at the beginning. Um, but there you go, I just did a massive breath and I <laughs> didn't delete it out. I think, you know, podcasts are much more conversational. You expect those kind of sounds in them. You expect laughing and piggy sounds and fucking kids screaming in the background because hashtag COVID. You expect, you know, doorbell things, although to be fair, I do try to get rid of those. But, you know, it's natural for there to be some sounds, extraneous sounds like in a podcast. You can't do that with an audiobook. There are lots of different methods for dealing with breathing and one way to understand the amount of breathing that's allowed in an audiobook is to listen to audiobooks. They don't have much in. Um, that said, I I don't know if it's different non-fiction to fiction, but I listened to an audiobook sample of Addie LaRue on Audible, narrated by Julia Whelan um, this week. And there was more breathing than I expected in there. That said, Julia often breathes on the ends of words. So um, what I tended to do was breathe, hold and pause for one beat, then narrate. And the reason I did that is it put a gap between the breath and the narration uh, where there were no waveforms and that was easier to spot one and also then it made cutting it out easier because there was space between the breath and the word starting. So I'm going to read another example with breathing at the start and the end. So this is what I would do. There's laughing and piggy snorts and gasps and deep breaths. But what Julia Whelan did was more like this. There's laughing and piggy snorts and gasps and deep breaths. It is genuinely and completely up to you how you deal with this and how much you remove. 
I personally try to cut out as many breaths as possible because most of the audiobooks that I have listened to don't have a lot of breathing in them, although of course there is some, especially in longer sentences where you, you know, you have to be really clever with editing if, you know, to get rid of the breathing, otherwise you just leave it in. Um, I actually feel like maybe I cut too many out, but I'm not sure. I think I probably need to listen to more audiobooks to like, and be listening intentionally to learn that particular thing. Editing the them out is a techie aspect and something that I'm sure um, you'll have to wrangle with in your own editing software. As I've mentioned before, I used Amadeus Pro and all I did was highlight the section that I wanted deleting and then hit the delete button, like the backspace button on my keyboard. So um, that was it, simple as that. It is very easy to delete the stuff. Um, the hardest bit is listening and finding the bits that you want to delete. And of course, I would then go back and re-listen to that section to make sure it then was smooth. Okay, on to speaking and narrating. First of all, silence. One of the requirements that Carl had for me was for me to be quiet for a few seconds at the start and end of each track. This allowed him to gather up a baseline room tone, which he could then match all of the uh, levels for the rest of the audio. Now, I don't know if that was unique to Carl, I suspect not. I know that you need at least a second of silence um, at the start and end of each track, but um, that I just thought I would let you know that because that was something I hadn't known before. Okay, narrating. I'm still not quite sure why speaking is so exhausting, but I was genuinely surprised at how shattered I was after sessions. I suppose because I'm thinking about breathing and speaking and performing and not moving or crinkling fabric and not popping peas and a myriad of other things, that is why it was so tiring. But I wanted to give you some technical uh, examples. I tried, to, uh, I tried to stand about a foot away from the mic. I don't know if that's what everyone else does, but that felt about right. I was probably between one and two feet. Um, I'm in a small booth, so there isn't much room anyway. Um, but one of the reasons I do that in particular is because I tend to over enunciate. And so, you know, you have to be a little bit further back to avoid popping peas. So I'm going to give you an example of what a popped pea is and then how not to do it. This is popping peas. Peter Perfect picked a piece of pickled pepper. Okay, so hopefully you heard the um, sort of fud that appears in the audio and it's not very nice to listen to. Now, um, P's, fuzz, was a few other letters were a bit of a bitch if you over enunciate and being British and obviously speaking as much or as close to the Queen's English as I could whilst narrating, um, you do tend to over enunciate and thus pop all of the fucking P's. Now, pops will fry your audio, even with a windshield or pop filter. So you really do need to make sure you're um, enunciating clearly without over enunciating. Uh, some of the things that I did was I kind of almost let go of the P. Um, I tried to say P's much more softly. Um, whereas if I was, you know, saying it, you know, uh, as Queen's English as I could, it would be much more Peter Piper picked a piece of pickled pepper, you know, where, whereas if I said it just much more casually, it would be, you know, Peter Piper picked a piece of pickled pepper. And there, all of the peas are much less. Okay, I did exaggerate a little bit for effect, but I just want you to hear the differences in um, how I'm narrating or how I'm speaking to you on the podcast. Um, yeah, so that uh, kind of letting go of the word is something that I did. I, I don't know how to describe it other than just almost letting the word go. <laughs> that is how I how I got round that. Um, I also try to start with my mouth open. I do have quite a clicky clacky mouth, which is very frustrating. Um, so you can hear it actually if you go back and listen. I'm sure you'll be able to hear some of the sounds. But um, one of the things that I do is I try to start with my mouth open. So instead of starting here, I'm going to start with my mouth closed, Peter Piper, and now this is me starting with my mouth open, Peter Piper. 
so while neither of the peas were popped, because I think I've <laughs> ingrained it into myself not to pop peas anymore, um, you will hear that the word was slightly smoother and softer the second time when I started with my mouth open and on the time when I started with my mouth closed, the P was slightly more windy, slightly more breathy. So yeah, there are a couple of examples of how to help yourself. Um, it's starting with your mouth open, pausing, narrating also gets rid of a lot of clicks and clacks from the saliva uh, when you open your mouth to start a word. God, this is such a fucking gross conversation. Um, ugh, I'm like shuddering. So I speak using my normal voice. Um, I do try to make sure the gain is rel relatively low. That is basically the, um, well, I don't know the technical term, but it's one of the buttons on the back of the mic anyway. Um, and uh, I was actually very surprised at how low the gain should be. Now, I think I've mentioned already that I paid for a one hour consultation with Carl. What he got me to do was to record a few minutes of the, uh, I just think I just did the intro. And then he told me how to adjust the gain and level to make sure that I was producing the audio quality needed um, for ACX and Findaway. And this was invaluable. I can't tell you how invaluable this is because one of the biggest lessons I learned was that I had my mic facing the wrong fucking way and I didn't have a clue. Like, I don't know how long, how many podcasts I must have recorded with the mic the wrong way around, but it's slightly mortifying. Um, I didn't know that there was a front and back. So yeah, like God forbid I'd done the whole podcast, the whole audiobook, you know, <laughs> with the mic the wrong way around, I would have had to have re-recorded it all. I genuinely think that that consult was the best money I spent and it was a bargain. I know, I'm not even sure it was $50. I don't know, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, I, I highly recommend that you find somebody who knows their shit and have a consult with them. Okay, on to narrating mistakes. If I made a mistake in the booth, I would usually <laughs> cuss like a violent sailor, um, something that made for a very delightfully fun outtake reel for my patrons. In reality, what I would do is I would pause when I'd made a mistake and then I would take a breath and say the offending line again and just continue narrating. When I wasn't turning the air blue, I would also blow raspberries or click my fingers because these all create spikes in the waveforms, a bit like the popped pea. So if I click, that's obviously quite loud. Sorry, everyone, uh, for you guys. Um, but that means it's really identifiable when it comes to editing. Something else, mistakes include hearing dogs barking, cars, planes, belly rumbles, anything in the background. If you hear it, you can trust me when I say your mic can also hear it. Um, the number of times that I had to stop for fucking like 10 years because dogs were yapping at birds was unbelievable. Even cars rumbling on the street 30 meters away, still audible. I couldn't believe how powerful my mic was. And it, and as much as it was fantastic for creating good audio, it was a fucking pain in the ass, to be honest with you, with all of the issues. Um, one thing I did to try to do to combat this was record first thing in the morning, straight after the school run, as the roads were quieter as all the day job folks had fucked off to their day jobs, the kids were at school, and the only people left at home were old codgers and creative randos like me. Speed. Ugh. This was the most difficult aspect for me. As a podcaster, I'm used to speaking normally, um, and I know that some podcasters do speak slightly slower than me, but hey, I'm excitable, I'm bubbly, I speak at a thousand miles per hour, and I kind of like it. Like, I don't, you know, this is how I speak. That said, <laughs> it's too fast for an audiobook. And, you know, I really think I probably do need to slow down a bit for um, the next audiobook that I do. I also say this because I think if I had been slower, I wouldn't have made as many fuck ups as I had. Um, just because you, you know, you're saying the word slower, which means you're reading slower, which means you give your brain more time to say the correct words instead of like tongue tying yourself. Um, I don't know that I have any good advice on this other than to say one thing that is useful is to listen to audiobooks on normal speed whilst reading a copy of the book at the same time. 
what you should do is to try to read along speaking, obviously, not in your, not reading in your head, but speak the words at the same time as you're listening to them to try and match the audiobook narrator's pace. I'm not going to say to do that with my book because I don't think I'm necessarily a good example. I probably was a bit too fast on the audiobook. But, you know, I, it's, I don't know many people that listen to audiobooks on one speed. Everybody I know t- turns up the speed. So what does it fucking matter? I just narrated at the pace that was fun for me. Um, what I will say is that some parts, uh, for me specifically, and perhaps this is more so in nonfiction than fiction, but some bits felt like they should be faster, especially if the tone I'd implied was faster. So like a run on sentence, like, a, well, like a run on sarcastic sentence, or I don't know if like, I don't know. There were just occasions where I would speed up for performance purposes, but it was for performance purposes and not just because, you know, I don't know. I think you, like one of the questions my patrons asked me was how do you stay consistent with speed? And I, I don't have a good answer. I just naturally spoke at the pace that felt right. Bear in mind you are reading. So your brain, I think will slow you down just fractionally because you're having to speak and read simultaneously and obviously you're also performing so I think that naturally makes you slow down a tiny bit um but yeah I just it's like putting your game face on you you go I step into that booth and I become the performer and I think that helped me stay consistent in my version and my definition of what performing was Okay, quantity. Uh, As I think I've already mentioned, I try to limit my sessions to one to two hour recording bursts to keep my voice healthy. I'm not a professional narrator. um, And even though I was as as a teenager, I I have lost the vocal muscle uh, when I used to be able to go for several hours a day. One thing I would always do was to finish the chapter or chapter summary that I was working on in that session. So that meant sometimes I finished in under that Uh, you know, one to two hour frame. And sometimes it took me slightly longer. The reason for that is that I wanted the background based audio to match for each chapter. Um, I think that probably made Carl's life slightly easier. And I also really don't like leaving things unfinished. I didn't want to leave a chapter half done. I wanted to be able to cross off that task at the end of that session. One other thing that I did, and this may not be helpful for everybody, but I mixed up the long chapters in with the short chapters. So I would record short, long, short, long. And what that did was it kept me motivated. I'm sure some people will want to do a straight read and record from front to back, um, but I don't even write like that. So, you know, I wasn't about to record that way. Um, Matching a short and long chapter just helped me feel like I was making progress and achieving. All right, on to voices. Given this was nonfiction and first person nonfiction, the only real voice I had to do was like mine, but on steroids, because obviously it's a performance. Um, That said, when I read titles or subtitles, I did kind of drop my tone a little and make it slightly flatter to indicate that it was a title and not normal text. So I am now going to read um, the title of this section in a flatter tone and then um, in in the sort of title tone that I would use and then I'm going to read it um, as if I was narrating. Number five, recording is Fifty Shades of Savage, but I kind of liked it. So that was like my title voice. And then this is what it would be if I was narrating. Number five, recording is Fifty Shades of Savage. But I kind of liked it. So obviously you can clearly tell the difference between those two. But yeah, these are some of the ways that I just tried to differentiate for when something was more serious. Other times, um, yeah, no, hang on, let me start uh, somewhere else. So my natural tone for narrating my own words is very roller coaster. Like you guys listen to me on the podcast, you know that I <laughs> express everything deeply <laughs> in the most, you know, violently uh, vocal way as possible. Um, I do have a roller coaster tone. I'm probably, you know, slightly less roller coaster 
in just general day-to-day -day conversation, but I want this to be interesting for you. And I, you know, would like you to listen to the whole podcast. So I do try to vary my tone, uh, perhaps a little bit more than I do in, in person. Um, yeah, so, you know, narrating my words, I did try to use a full vocal range. Um, but when I was reading a quote, um, or as I said, the titles, I did use less roller coaster tones and I tried to be a bit more serious. And where a silly voice was required or a villain's voice, I just, you know, I just, I just had a go. I did slightly deeper voices or slightly gravelly voices. Um, I even <laughs> botch jobbed a Yoda voice, which was quite funny. Um, so yeah, like I just had a go. I just let loose and just tried, you know, that's all you can do ultimately. Um, that said, you know, I'm really not an expert at voices and there are some resources um, in the show notes at the bottom uh, with links. Um, but I particularly recommend the audiobook Storyteller by Lorelai King because she does talk about how to do voices. And I also have um, episode 104 on the Rebel Author podcast with Gillian Yetta, where she also talks about voices and she gives demonstrations of them partway through. Number six, editing is Satan's favourite form of torture. There I was, smug as a fucking button when I finished recording. Off I fucked, back to my computer, thinking this was about to be done and dusted, mate. But, oh, fucking no. The editing took longer than the fucking recording. And I am swearing here because, like, honestly, it... Oh God, it drove me bananas. I had to snip out repeated lines, fuck ups, breathing, swearing, drink slurping, burping, belly rumbling, you fucking name it. I had to cut it out. <sighs> uh, waveforms, let's talk about waveforms. After the 87 years that I spent editing, I rather rapidly learned what the waveforms of individual sounds look like. looked like. Looked like, that's easy for me to say. This enabled me to pick them out faster. For example, um, my breathing tends to look like a flattish kind of centimetre long mound. Well, depending on how long of a breath I took, but it's definitely flatter than a lot of the words that I'm saying. So that's quite easy to pick out. I usually have a click sound when I start a sentence, especially when I start a sentence beginning with the letter O. Um, it's very small, looks like an eye, sort of vertical stick shape, and I just cut that out. Claggy mouth sounds look like a series of those shapes and then there's sort of like a sticky sound um, that I sometimes make and sometimes it's during a phrase and then, then it's very hard to get rid of and then sometimes it's at the start and end and then obviously I can cut those out. So those were the ones that I was able to cut out. Um, and there's also a kind of weird bent tra trapezium slash bent in the middle kind of triangle at the start of words. And that was, I can't remember what shape that was, but I remember seeing that a lot and having to cut that out too. Marking edits. For me personally, I edited all of the mistakes out in post-production. If I made an error while recording, I would, as I said, blow a raspberry or click or shout wanker or some other obscenity to blow um, the audio. And that obviously created a very large waveform spike, which would help me identify where there were clearly mistakes. Um, and obviously that helped when I was back at the computer. So what I would do was open each file and just start listening from the beginning. When there was a problem, a clickety-clack, titty-fucking-whack sound, whatever, then that shouldn't be there, I would pause, pause the audio and edit. Where there were speech mistakes, I would cut the audio so that the fucked up phrase was then separated from the good audio. And it basically made my audio file look like a zebra, but it also made my life a lot easier in the booth when I was editing because I knew exactly where I had to go for the mistake. The other thing I did was sticky tab and underline the sentence in a paper copy of the book. And um, like if it was a popped P, I'd put double P. If it was like wrong phrasing or something, whatever, I would just make a note to myself so I knew what it was that um, the mistake was. If you prefer digital ebooks, then obviously you can do the same. Um, it's just that the sticky tabs meant I could flip straight to the error and hit record. So re-recording errors. <laughs> the first time I went to re-record errors, I jumped in the booth and just hit record. I recorded all of the errors back to back in one go. 
That was an epic failure. Don't do that. The tones of my voice weren't right and didn't match how I'd said uh, the previous phrase and somehow the gain had also been shunted up so the levels were off anyway. Um, and of course some of that can be fixed in mastering but you know the mismatched sound was not fixable. Cue attempt two. I opened one chapter. I listened to the audio right before the mistake, sort of, you know, what clearly was a phrase. And then I listened to the mistake itself so I knew what I'd done wrong. When I was satisfied with what I needed to do and I need and I knew the kind of tone that that, that phrase, that mistake phrase needed, I would then hit record. I'd jump in the booth and re-record the error. I would say the error phrase two to three times in case the first phrase wasn't good enough. And I have to say quite often it wasn't. Then I stopped, stop, well, I jumped out of the booth, stopped recording. And in the garage, I would listen to the correct phrase, to the corrected phrases. And I would pick the one I'd like. I'd get rid of the other ones and cut. That's some very loud, pissy motorbike chav guy outside. Wanker. Anyway. I would, um, yeah, I would stitch the errors uh, back to the good audio so that basically when there were no more zebra stripes left, the file was finished in edits. Proofer edits, no matter how optimistic you are. And by this point, I really was borderline hysterical and wanted the thing done. Your proofer is going to pick up errors. I had proofed the book already because I was editing. Um, you know, I'd done all the corrections and I'd listened from start from the start of the track to the end for every single track, but I was still surprised by how many errors there were. Mostly I had left in repeated phrases, so where I hadn't quite snipped out the, the mistake audio or whatever. But there were other mistakes as well. Th things like um, where I'd not said something quite exactly as it was written in the book. Now, I was surprised that I did that because I was straight reading from the book. So I don't know what misfire happened between like me reading the words and them coming out of my mouth. But I was surprised. There was a good handful, maybe a dozen or so phrases that I hadn't quite said the way I'd written, written them in the ebook. You have two choices. You can either change the ebook. Um, or you can change the audio. Now, I changed the ebook in probably 90% of the occasions because I could not be fucked to go back in the audio booth. Um, second, you want to do this so that your book syncs with WhisperSync. Although I, I have been told that some people purposefully try not to let books sync with WhisperSync because you get paid slightly less. But um, honestly, I don't have enough experience to really comment on that. Um, and I just figured I would try and get it to whisper sync. Um, yeah, so I changed the ebook in most circumstances, except for when it changed the meaning of the sentence. And then I would go back and change it in the audiobook. Number seven, uploading and publishing. We are almost getting there. This was a world of fun. Not. Thankfully, I had Carl to do the mastering, so he sorted out all the levels and requirements for ACX and the other stores. Uh, when I got the files back, I still had three that needed adjusting slightly again, um, but that was a very quick process and he turned them around, you know, the same day. So that was absolutely fine. Um, you know, I I sent it to Carl because I had to weigh up the best use of my time and I didn't figure that, you know, learning, spending hours and hours learning to master was a good use of my time. When uploading I'm, and joining the new distributors, I did have to fill out all the W8 kind of tax forms again and that's always a source of anxiety for me. I hate tax stuff, numbers, anything that's like legally important. It does kind of stress me out, but you just have to get through it. Um, I have to say, I did actually find the upload process quite stressful. Um, it reminded me very much of uploading my first book because you don't really know what you're doing. Now, that said, most of the back end for the publishers is very, very similar similar to the back end of um, ebook upload. You know, you upload your metadata, your book title, your author names, your narrator names. One thing that was new to me is that they asked for copyright years. So they asked for the year the book was copyright. So when, what year did you publish the book and what year is the copyright for the audio. 
Um, what else was different? I think that is probably most of it. Um, but, you know, just to reiterate, I have a lot of sympathy for first time writers uploading their first books. Like it is a lot. Um, you know, and there were things like the sample file, which I didn't have when I first went to do this. And I had to pause and go and get a sample file. So in terms of distribution, um, I chose to go direct to ACX, although I am non-exclusive because I would like my books to be in libraries. I used Findaway Voices for pretty much everything else except Kobo. So I have also gone direct to Kobo. Not everyone is going to want multiple dashboards and that's fine. If that's the case, just use a, an aggregator like Findaway Voices or Soundwise or I don't know, other ones. <laughs> There is a resource in uh, the show notes that is an uh, ally blog post talking about uh, alternative distributors to ACX. All right, number eight. We are here, the final one. Green Eye Doe Monster. So what was the cost of production? The booth build came in at around 250 to 300 pounds. The most expensive part was buying uh, sheets of MDF and the audio panels. So the panels were around 100 pounds, including VAT and shipping. The MDF sheeting was about 100 pounds again. Um, and then I already had the carpet scraps, so I didn't pay for that, and I had the foam from before. Uh, of course, like, you know, throw in things like screws and wheels um, and odd bits like that. And I am pretty sure it totted in around 250 to 300 pounds. Um, of course, I've mentioned prices for the, the other stuff. So things like my microphone, which was 130 quid. Um, I paid around 50 quid for the audio software. Although, of course, you don't have to because there is free software like Audacity. I also paid about £100 for consults and mastering. Um, so I'm sure I'm probably forgetting things. There are some prices uh, at the earlier bit of the episode and also in the show notes. But, you know, I think all in, it probably came in around or just under £500 to produce the audiobook. But that obviously is not including the endless hours that I spent doing it. Um, and of course, in terms of physical outlay of cash, the next audiobook is is going to be less than a hundred pounds because the only thing I'm going to have to pay for is the mastering. Pricing. I struggled with pricing because Audible doesn't tell you how they price. <laughs> you can go by guesswork um, and I did eventually find a blog somewhere that uh, had that guesswork. So um, I've priced at $14.95. Um, yeah, I mean, Find A Way does actually give pricing suggestions, but I felt maybe they were more representative of fiction. I don't know. Um, but they were not representative of what, of what I found on Audible. They were much lower than what I found on Audible. In the end, what I did was I asked friends and went to the US Audible store and checked what audiobooks are in my genre with a similar length were priced at. And then I matched the pricing. It was harder for library pricing, which is an option on Find A Way, because um, there wasn't, I didn't know. Like, I know that, you know, you price at two to four times the amount of an ebook for library pricing, um, but there, I couldn't find any information anywhere. I checked books, I checked blog posts, I checked resources, like, there was nothing that told me. So, in the end, I plumped for doubling the price. Um, because I'd rather the price be slightly lower for my first audiobook to encourage library borrows than I would, uh, than I am worrying about smashing bank on this one. There's one other financial distribution mechanism that I'm interested in doing, which is selling direct. I recently purchased Joanna Penn and Mark Lefebvre's The Relaxed Author in audio direct from Joanna's website, and I was surprised at how smooth the interface was. It was really fucking slick. Um, that said, to do this via book funnel, it does cost an extra $20 a month. So I'm still trying to understand whether I should do this now or whether I should wait until I've got a second audiobook out and thus it's more likely that the $20 will be covered. I do personally find that once you start these subscriptions, it's quite hard to undo them because you establish a precedent that your audience can buy from you in certain places. And, you know, I don't want to piss off my audience if I 
make a promise like you can buy direct from me I would like to continue making that promise so yeah I haven't done this yet um and I'm just thinking about it you know because that's $240 extra a year on a subscription that you're already doing so you want to be sure that you can make that money um, and I think it's another reason to be cautious when hopping between wide and exclusive and back again because you know you do establish audiences all right we are nearly at the end of this absolute monster episode and uh, I don't know if you can hear but my voice is starting to go so it's a good job we're nearly at the end was it worth it this is really hard for me to answer and this was another patron question and honestly until I start to see the income that's going to come in from this I can't really tell you whether it was financially worth it what I suspect is that, you know, like most launches, I will get a small bump and then um, it will, you know, level off down to whatever it's going to be going forward. I suspect that the more audiobooks I have, the more worthwhile it will be because that is generally uh, the case in business for anything. The more products you produce, the more, you know, you earn. It is uh, exponential um, and compounding. So yeah, I think that maybe I will update you once it's been out for a while or maybe um, after I've published another one or two uh, uh, audiobooks, I will have a think and see uh, because I would like to be able to do discounts and things and uh, but I can't really do that until I have more audiobooks. Um, so yeah, then I will be able to get a better lay of the land financially and I you know if someone reminds me, I'm sure I will tell you uh, how it went. What I can tell you is that this has been invaluable in terms of learning a new skill. If you are a learner at heart and you like learning, I highly recommend you do this, even if you only do it once. It was so great to learn a new thing and learn a new skill. Um, I, As I mentioned at the top of the episode, I really enjoyed being outside of my comfort zone. I know that's not something that everybody enjoys and that's okay, maybe don't do this then. I also really, really loved the performative aspect of this in the booth. I had forgotten how much of a performer I am. Um, I don't regret giving up the acting or voice work, but I definitely miss it. And I think this has shown me that I miss it. And it's definitely something that I would like to continue doing. So I do absolutely intend to continue recording, well, narrating. What I may not do is the editing because I didn't really enjoy that aspect of it um and you know if this audiobook can wash its face then maybe I will invest in an editor for next time would I do it again for non-fiction 100% I think I've made that clear would I record fiction mm, not sure I think I need to practice voices more um just to like build up my confidence I don't feel even though even though I have a roller coaster voice and I know that I have the vocal range to create different voices because it is one of my most fun silly games that I do with Atlas is we're always doing accents and silly voices and all of this stuff but I don't have the confidence to do that for a full audiobook so I'm not sure whether the amount of time that I would have to expend to build my confidence or to produce a fiction audiobook would be worth it I just don't know I don't know if it's just me I just feel not confident I'm absolutely fucking terrified about publishing this audiobook to be perfectly honest it's new and scary and I did it all by myself and I don't know if it's any good so you know I yeah I I just need some time I think to to get to that point um I think that in all honesty, it probably took me far longer than it should have done to produce, um, like, well, to produce, edit and upload the audiobook. And I don't really like to admit that because it kind of feels like a failure um, because I really genuinely thought it would be faster than it was. Lots of the estimates uh, when you hear people talking about this suggest three hours of time for every one hour of finished audio. Given that 13 Steps to Evil is four and a half hours, that should have been around 13 and a half hours maybe one to two working days in total. <laughs> oh, silly Sasha. Oh, there is no fucking way it only took me that long. <laughs> like granted, this was the first time I'd done it and I made every mistake along the way. Um, 
what I know is that I definitely spent two full working days editing on screen because um, I did two big chunk chunky days. There was also a smattering of hours around that for on-screen editing. Recording, I couldn't even tell you. I know that I mostly did it in small chunks and um, I, I didn't record the hours that I spent in the booth. So I, I don't know, I can't tell you. Re-recording edits probably took one to one and a half full working days, I reckon. I did a big chunk at the end of four straight hours on the last day because I was just so hysterical and wanted it done. Um, and I probably spent a week doing two hours every morning. So uh, yeah, I reckon one to one and a half working days sounds about right. So, you know, in summary, this is not a small endeavour to pursue. And perhaps people who are more efficient and effective at this and at narrating and at recording will be better. But I think if you don't have a lot of experience and you are wanting to do this for your first audiobook, I would really account for a significant amount of time. I would say I, it probably took me two working weeks to do this full working weeks, eight hours every day for two weeks. Maybe that's a slight over the top, but you know, it, it, it took a while. So um, when I first wrote that, oh, for fuck's sake, Alexa. Um, when I first wrote this um, post, I actually put that it took me a working month and then I tried to work out the amount of hours. So I can't, I can't give you an accurate estimation, but it is going to take a chunk of your time. Um, I do think that I will be faster next time. And so that is some reassurance to me at least. Also, I think that audio is sticking around and it grows year on year and has done for several years. So I do think overall thus far, the investment has been worth it. All right, that is the end of the lessons that I learned, but I wanted to give you a bonus segment. And this is some strategic questions to ask yourself about whether or not you should do this. Going in to narrate and produce your own audiobook is full on. So um, yes, here are the, some of the strategic things I weighed up before committing to this process. Number one, I ask myself, which are my best-selling books? Well, Villains is one of my best-selling books. And um, the other one that sells consistently well is The Anatomy of Prose. Both are kind of evenly matched, um, but Villains was half the length of prose. And so that felt like the easier option to start with. I do think that the next audiobook that I do will be The Anatomy of Prose, but I am not going to start doing that until I have closed off some more projects. And the reason for that is I feel like it will be quicker if I don't open up 75,000 different projects and I just give myself the time to do it start to finish. So mm -hmm, Sasha learned that lesson. Mm -hmm, she's not super human she can't do all of the things um yeah and so the next question I asked was did I have a history of selling that book well and consistently well yes I did and therefore it felt like the time and money investment would likely be returned on on audio too if it sells well in ebook and paperback it's probably going to sell well in audiobook heroes is my least well-selling non-fiction book and so you know that is likely to be the last audiobook I do if I'm going to invest time in narrating, like my time, I would like to, you know, that is, I'm not getting compensated whilst I do that. And therefore, you know, to to make sure I can pay my mortgage, uh, I need to try and at least get um, a return on my investment for the hours that I put in. Number three, do I have some level of technical capability? Now, you really don't need much. Don't worry about this. If you have published a book, you know, and you can work out all of the KDP dashboards and Kobo dashboards and all of the rest of it, then, um, you know, and you can firefight your way through formatting, then you can edit and produce an audiobook. There really isn't vast amounts of technical stuff. The most technical stuff is the mastering and <laughs> I just outsource that. <laughs> so <laughs> I just couldn't be fucked. Uh, yeah, I don't really have any lessons to say about mastering because I just pay someone else to do it. Then another question that I ask myself is, am I interested in doing more than one audiobook? You may only want to do one and you're okay with investing the time in producing one and that's fine. I wasn't really 
okay with only doing one and spending all this time learning. Uh, if I did it, I wanted to make sure that I was going to continue doing it. So um, for me, I was happy to give up the time because I knew that this was a long-term thing and that I would be uh, producing more audiobooks. So setting up properly and making a plethora of fuck ups on this first audiobook felt okay. It was very much, you know, like publishing books. <clears throat> Number five, do you like performing or being a little bit silly? Uh, this is important because narrating is hard work and if you're not interested in that performative aspect, it may not be for you. You can, of course, do more of a straight read and that's okay. Um, you know, lots of audiobooks are just straight reads, but I don't know. I, I kind of feel like this is a place where you can play and have fun, so why not perform it? You know, I'm not saying that you have to suddenly become Julia Roberts or Tom Hanks but um you know just just be you be you a little bit more um and have fun with it do you this is number six do you have an established audio audience now not everyone is going to have an established audio audience and this isn't a do or die question but as a podcaster I am safely assuming that those that listen to podcasts in audio are likely to listen to audiobooks too and therefore it felt like probably I would be okay I would at least get a few sales um, and have a head start with the audience building Number seven, and this is the last question. Are there any parts of this process that you can outsource? Obviously, if you are narrating, then you can't get rid of that. But, you know, you could if you <laughs> didn't want to do any narration. But then I'm not sure how useful this podcast is going to be for you. Uh, but anyway, is there someone else that can do the mastering for you? Could you pay someone to edit for you? Um, would an upfront consult work in terms of helping you establish the correct setup? I really can't tell you how much I valued that consult. I definitely think it was the best money I spent. And if you are considering doing more than one audiobook, I, I strongly urge you to pay for a consult. Um, and I, like I said, I will leave the links to Carl's services in the show notes. All right, that is it from this absolutely fucking monster solo show. I hope you found this a useful bonus episode. And like, if you did, could I ask that you share it with some friends or, you know, relatives or other creatives who might find it useful? It really helps to, you know, keep people, bring new people in listening. And hopefully I've shared enough lessons that, you know, other creators will find this useful. If you are interested in listening to the finished audiobook that I have been talking about for over an hour, then you can purchase 13 Steps to Evil, How to Craft a Super Bad Villain from all of the usual places that you get your audiobooks uh, from, or you can request a copy from your library. And of course, I am going to leave links in the show notes. Now, just a final word, I've got some further resources for you. So um, some books that I recommend are narrated by the author, How to Produce an Audiobook on a Budget by Renee Canolti, Audio for Authors by Joanna Penn, Storyteller, How to Be an Audiobook Narrator by Lorelai King, Writing for Audiobooks, Audio First for Flow and Impact, Author Advice from Radio Writing by Jules Horn podcast episodes, episode six, which was how to DIY an audiobook with Renee Canolti, episode 23, how to write audio uh, for audio with Jules Horn, episode 78, how to sell ebooks and audiobooks on Kobe with Tara Kremen, uh, and episode 104, how to work with an audiobook narrator with Gillian Yetta. And a few blog posts then I've included in the show notes are Publishing Alternatives to ACX, How Audiobook Authors and Narrators Are Paid by Audible ACX, We Think. Quite controversial uh, blog post talking about the issues that authors have found uh, in being paid by uh, Audible ACX recently. The Ultimate Guide to Self-Publishing Audiobooks on uh, Self-Publishing Advice uh, from Ally and audio promotion for indie authors. So that's it. There will be links, most likely affiliate links in the show notes. Um, everything that I've mentioned should be linked in the show notes. And that's it. Yep. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have found it useful. Please um, 
text me, write me, DM me, whatever. Let me know whether or not you did find it useful. And um, yeah, good luck with your audiobooks. And don't forget, you can go get your copy of 13 Steps to Evil in audio right now. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review. Oh,